interest in the new organism, um, in particular implementing um, environmental and traditionally sustainable principles in town planning and smart growth. For 25 years, uh, Bob has been active in the development of innovative yet practical methods for applying modern trends in commercial development to more than 400 new towns and historic cities abroad. On a personal note, um, I'm very happy to say that I've known Bob and worked with him and been friends since 1992 when we both were on the same team for the downtown master plan for downtown West Palm Beach. And I uh, even spent a long cold winter in Detroit as Bob's design director up there, but my blood is too thin for the Detroit winter. So, Bob, it's a great pleasure to have you back here. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Gibbs. Thank you, Dina, and it's really great to be back in uh, West Palm Beach. Uh, I probably get the greatest job in the world because I get to advise cities as to how to borrow and steal the best practices from shopping malls. And I get to tell shopping malls how to do the same for cities. And uh, it seems like everybody wants to be something that they're not. Right now, all of the shopping malls are trying to emulate cities. And uh, they want to build experiential places. And the cities very often are trying to borrow from the best practices of shopping malls. Not that they want should become malls. Uh, as a part of this presentation, I have agreed to give you two months of free consulting by internet. <laughs> if you want free consulting. And uh, this is my email address, or you can get it through Dana. And I'd be more than happy to correspond with you. I travel over 200 days a year. And one of the things that makes it bearable is that I get to communicate with people. And so send me, fo upload photos, send me photos, and just ask me questions or clarifications. Uh, this is my email address, rgibbs at gibbsplanning.com. Or we also, if you're a Facebook junkie, we have an institute, the Urban Retail Institute. And every day we post articles about Urban Retail Institute, if you'd like to follow the Facebook group. Our practice is geared around stopping the suburbs and stopping suburban sprawl by making it more profitable to have commerce in cities. I feel that the real cure for suburban sprawl is to make it less profitable in cities. And so we uh, have strategic and tactical applications to help the small independent retailer in small towns or large cities compete with the malls. And we want you to compete by making more money. Uh, the retail industry is in flux, as you can see all around here. The department stores are closing by the dozen. Uh, but uh, the internet is still only accounts for 8% of all retail sales. Still 92 cents of every dollar is spent in a brick and mortar store. And research is showing that people are still preferring to shop in real stores if it's a better experience than shopping online. And there's still an opportunity, and many of the internet companies that were internet only, like Warby Parker, Amazon, have found that by opening real brick and mortar stores, their internet sales go up by 30%. So there's a flood right now for internet companies to open real stores. That being said, within the next five years, 25% or 500 malls will be closing in the United States. And most of those malls are closing because they're losing their department stores. You cannot have a sustainable mall without department stores. Department stores bring at least a third of the traffic to the mall. And most of the tenants in their lease have the right to break the lease and leave the mall when the department stores close. What does that mean for cities? The retailers that, most of the retailers that are in malls that are closed tell us that they want to go stay in the same market where the mall is, but they want to open in real downtowns. And there is going to be a tremendous flood right now for mall tenants that to leave the malls and to go into downtowns that want them. Unfortunately, almost no downtowns that we work with want mall tenants. Most malls that we work with only want independent retailers and they want the bulk of the shopping to occur out in the suburbs. So there's a little bit of a conflict there. If you have 
highly successful and attractive retailers on your main street, it has a direct positive effect on all other land uses. Residential value, home values are higher, apartment values are higher, offices rent for more, and everybody benefits when you have a successful downtown with nice uh, main street shops. There's something called the Starbucks effect and the Whole Foods effect where if you can walk to a Starbucks or Whole Foods or they're equal, then rents are 12 to 20 percent higher for both apartments and office. We work all over the United States. We've done over 150 projects in Florida. Florida's, I'm based in Michigan, but Florida's really my second home. Uh, we just finished a five-year assignment with South Memphis, Tennessee, because this lower left was their only grocery store for 30,000 people, and the upper right was their only restaurant. And we're finding, and this was a very low income area where more than half of the residents lived below the poverty line. And we're finding that very modest income areas are greatly underserved for retail. The national average is that there's 22 square feet of retail per person in the United States. Most of these uh, urban, modest income areas have less than three square feet of retail. And many retailers have their growth now focused on low income, underserved cities. That's where a lot of retailers are blaming the growth. We just finished an assignment in the Hamptons in New York, just the opposite of the South Memphis area, where the average home sells for $12 million. And they called us in, it's a, they have a very tony Main Street, Southampton. They called us in because one summer they had 30 vacancies. And this is a place that has $100 per square foot rents. They never had vacancies, and we were called in to tell them why. Uh, which is always a lot of fun to get called in to tell people why their downtown is failing. Uh, mostly it's just common sense. We were just called into two very prosperous cities in Florida because their problem was nobody would park in the parking garages or the off-street parking lots, and everybody wanted to park on the main street. They couldn't figure out why. So they flew me down from Detroit, and what we found was their parking decks were very expensive. Their off-street lots were very expensive with meters, and their main street was free. <laughs> and they couldn't figure out why nobody would park in the parking decks, and why everybody wanted to park where it was free. So sometimes I get softballs thrown at me. When that's the case, I won't tell you the answer to you pay me. <laughs> so there's two cities not too far from here that have that issue. Uh, Southampton's challenge was, the reason they had the vacancies was, in one year, they moved the library over there, they, well, they lost the post office and moved out to the edge of town. They lost the little grocery store and they lost the small department store. They lost four anchors. And form follows anchors. You can't support more than 30,000 square feet of retail without an anchor. Grocery store, civic, I'll talk more about that later. And so by just moving the library from there to there, the families that go to the library could walk to the shops and restaurants. And a good library attracts about 1,200 people per day. And those are ideal shoppers. So we informed them that by letting the post office, the library, the museum, the market, and the others leave, uh, that they caused the uh, demise of downtown. By the way, most shopping streets are about 1,000 feet long. Most shopping districts are about 1,000 feet long. That's about as far as people will walk. Even all of the malls built in the US are generally a thousand feet from the department store to department store. We did a major strategy for the Walt Disney Company several years ago, advising them on how to reposition downtown Disney. They rebranded it to a new name. And uh, we get all sorts of very interesting clients. Uh, one of the simplest things you can do to revitalize your downtown and to have high sales is to have nice storefronts. And storefronts work best when they're painted a dark gloss color, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. If you have storefronts that look like this, then uh, these storefronts have a negative value on the surrounding properties, and the apartments, and the office, and the residential, 
will all sell for rent for much less. There is a direct correlation between the quality of your retail shops, the way they look, the way they perform, and the performance of other real estate. The shopping center industry is always in flux. This is nothing new that we have an internet crisis. Uh, we are always trying to catch up with new consumer trends. Uh, at one time, people only wanted to shop in malls, and now they only want to shop in open air or Main Street settings. And our job in the industry is to find out what you want and then to give it to you at a, at a, at a method better than you expect. There are certain basic core rules, though, for retail that apply to either downtown or suburban settings. And I'm going to go through those rules as, uh, as quickly as I can. One of the first rules is that people don't have to shop. Okay, you have to go to school, you have to go to work, you have to take your kids to a soccer game. You don't have to shop. So retailers have to constantly invent gimmicks to get you into the store. This is one of my favorite gimmicks. My son goes to school in Scotland and he's become very well groomed. He gets two hair cuts a week. He gets two hair cuts a week, I mean, Maybe he does. And it's because he gets a free shot of whiskey with every haircut. Uh, the retailers have to constantly invent reasons to get you into the store. And the best reason is the 50% off sale. Uh, my wife loves Macy's. She goes to Macy's every Saturday because they have a once in a lifetime sale every Saturday. She buys as much as she can carry. She comes home and tells me how much money she saved. <laughs> this is a uh, town center. Uh, a lot of our business since the recession has been to work with banks that repossessed failed town centers. And it's really been fascinating because we're learning that when you break the rules, you pay. Well, this is a beautiful town center built in Utah. The developer built 150,000 square feet of retail before he had any leases. And he said, if I build it, they'll come because I'm really a genius. And he hired a great architect. And the architect said, uh, I think you should build a grocery store that's only 8,000 square feet because I don't like big grocery stores. They creep me out. So he built an 8,000 square foot grocery store and then when he went to lease it, the grocer said, I need 50,000 feet, thank you very much. I'm going to go across the street and build a new strip center and all of the tenants that you would have gotten next to me are going to move next door to me. And that's what happened. So this center has been vacant for 25 years. It loses about $2 million a year because the, they broke the anchor rule. You can't have more than 25,000 square feet without an anchor, and the world's best anchor is a grocery store, just because of the size of the grocery. This is an interesting problem, a center we're working with in Maryland, and you can see some of the obvious. They, this has been uh, all vacant except 2,000 feet. It's 50,000 feet. You can see some of the problems. You can't see the tenants. The tenants are below grade. You have to walk all the way down there, turn around to go into that storefront. Just basic 101 challenges. And so this 50,000 square foot center is 49,000 square feet vacant. This is what 49,000 square feet. This is what a fourth bankruptcy looks like. Uh, this, uh, this center loses a million dollars a year. They did build apartments on top, and each apartment has to subsidize the million dollar loss by paying an extra $110 a month in rent. And the primary reason that this one failed, besides the great problem, was uh, they were next to a transit stop, and the city wouldn't let them build a parking lot. They only built 12 parking stalls for 50,000 feet. And they built the parking lot across the street next to the transit stop and it's across the five lane highway. And the city said, you don't need parking because you're next to a transit stop. And the developer in a moment of weakness agreed. And so they can't lease this center because there's only 12 parking spaces. This, is, this occurs daily in the United States and we work on hundreds and hundreds of failed centers. Now, one of the best ways of bringing people to your downtown or to your center is to have what I call the X factor. The X factor is when you have a place in which you fall in love with, where you have a, an emotional connection between 
the built environment and yourself. Paris, France is full of the X Factor. People fly to Paris, spend a lot of money to pretend they live there for a week, and then they walk around and they fall in love. Nantucket has the X Factor, the island of Nantucket. They, these places tend to have extraordinarily high sales. They tend to be very, very regulated. For example, in Nantucket, you can only paint your front door one of eight colors. They tend to be historic districts. Historic districts with strong codes and commissioners with a backbone always have higher sales. A Carmel by the Sea is another example of a beautiful place that's in California and has the X Factor, but it has the X Factor in part because it has very, very strict architectural design guidelines. Look at this beautiful storefront. This is the kind of place that people like to go to. They fall in love. It has the X factor. And this revolt results in extraordinarily high sales per square foot if you can achieve this. You Retailers will build to this level if the city requires it. Before retailers open stores, they send guys like me to attend your planning commission meeting to see how easy you are. If you're really easy, I call them and say, build the cheap plan, this city's a rollover. If you're really strict, they'll, they'll say, build the better plan, this city has high standards. Now what's happening is when I go to a city with low standards like this, the a retailer is calling back and saying, skip that city. I'm not going to open a store in a city with low standards. I'm not going to open a, st a store in a city that allows aluminum storefronts and tinted glass. I'm just not going to do it because I'm going to spend a half million dollars on my store and I don't want to be next to cheap, cheap wooden stores. You shouldn't allow tinted glass. You shouldn't allow anodized aluminum storefronts. You should require hand crack storefronts. You will get the better tenants and you will have the higher sales if you have the political will to do it. Neon is a great way of having the X Factor. I just completed a, almost a year-long study in Delray Beach, one of the great cities in America. And they have neon everywhere. It's just an extraordinarily beautiful city and it's filled with the X Factor. You can achieve the X Factor with, by hiring artists and have the artists design your storefronts. Look at this little storefront in Northern Michigan. It's a coffee shop with coffee cups surrounding the doorfront. You can do a lot with just simple landscaping and just good taste. This little shop has the X Factor and they really do it with just ivy and nice paint. It doesn't take a lot to do it. But you can create a place that offers an experience that you can't get on the internet. That's your mission. You know, so that if you have a better experience just double clicking and get a pair of shoes. You have a great experience in a store like this that you will remember for a long time. If you have stores that look like this, you're telling your customers and your citizens that whatever they buy in that town is overpriced, of low quality, and they're getting low service. You're telling the customer that they would be better off shopping online than shopping in your downtown. And you just shouldn't allow this. You should have high standards. Well, one of the easy ways of having the X Factor is just with flowers. Look at the lovely little flower boxes and planted stands. You can do a lot with flowers. And very often when I show this slide, cities will say, Bob, I planted a flower box in front of my store and it got vandalized one night so I didn't replace it. And I say shame on you. You're letting the, the, the low light of, the, of your community lower the bar. I work with some retailers that every night their flower box gets vandalized and they hire a landscaper every morning at 7 o'clock to come in and replant it. They refuse to give up and that's the broken window theory. Eventually the vandals will stop but you should, in a lot of cities, the DDAs will plant flowers, they will put in flower boxes and plant flowers around the stores. Most of the suburban projects that we work on are boring, like this one. This one, this is in Ohio. We were called into here because their sales are very low, and they wanted to know why. And I said, well, you're just too boring. You <laughs> don't have the X factor. Every storefront is the same black aluminum storefront. Every awning is black. Uh, there's no, 
out to paint the suburbs with it. Charleston, South Carolina, where I've had the privilege of working for 25 years, has the X factor. It is always listed as the best city in the world to go to for tourists. Because they're rewarded with great shops, they have the great French district, the great antiques district, and they have all the shops that tourists love, which are chains. <laughs> tourists love to go on vacation and shop at the same stores they shop at at home. Don't ask me why, but they do. And so Charleston has just this great mix. And when Apple Computer wanted to open a new store in Charleston, they said, we're opening on King Street instead of the mall. There were two malls they could have gone to. They said, we're opening on King Street because it has high design standards, and that's where the people are. People like Charleston. And the mayor said, whatever stores people like to shop at are the same stores I want in my downtown. This is one of the only cities in America that says, if you're a national retailer, you're welcome here as long as you have high standards for the storefront. So we told the mayor that they, he needs a dollar store because the residents of Charleston shop at dollar stores and they were driving out to the mall. And he said, fine, just make sure it doesn't say the dollar store, it says the Charleston market and make sure it's a beautiful storefront. And he's perfectly happy with that. This is very counterintuitive. Almost no cities I work with want national chains. All they want are the small independent retailers they close at night, they give poor service, and then nobody likes to shop here. That's their target tenant for the most part. And I love independence. I don't think you should ever have more than 20% nationals. But my feeling is if you're going to be sustainable, you must sell the goods and services that people want. You're not going to be sustainable by selling scented candles that people buy once a year. So why not have them shop for the goods and services that you really want? Now, some key principles. The number one key principle I want you to write down is don't build leasable space that you can't lease. <laughs> okay? Maintain high historical standards. Build handcrafted artistic storefronts. Pay attention to parking. Parking is the most misunderstood problem in most downtowns. And most downtowns that we work in are underperforming because of parking. And strive to have the X factor in your downtown. Go ahead and compete with the internet, compete with the malls by making your downtown more beautiful. Sustainable sales. Every retailer on your main street should be having sales of $350 a square foot per year. That should be your target goal. That, for a 1,200 square foot store, that means they have to do $1,000 per day in sales. $1,000 per day in sales. Uh, if you are not getting 300 or 350 a square foot in sales, then that retailer cannot afford to pay himself a living wage. Uh, he can't afford to be open at night. He can't afford to have the staff that he needs to have or she needs to have. You really need to have a goal of 350 a square foot per year. The average retailer that we work with on Main Street only has sales of $80 a square foot per year. And what that means is that they're not paying themselves a salary. They're probably taking out a home equity loan to buy inventory and they're payroll. And they're really a hobby retailer. And you don't want hobby retailers on your downtown because they keep lousy hours and they give lousy service. The average mall has sales of 275 a square foot per year, and that really should be the absolute minimum that you should shoot for. The highest mall average, the highest mall developer's average is 950 a square foot per year, and that's the Taubman Company. I was the urban planner for the Taubman. They built the Wellington Mall, and uh, uh, they have by far the highest sales per square foot because they treat shopping as a science. We study how you behave in malls. We study and we learn how to make you turn right. I learn how to make you turn left. I know how to make you slow down or go fast in a mall. I know how to completely control you in a mall. <laughs> and they do that. The better mall developers do it. And we just 
now apply those principles to downtowns. We want to control the shopper to stay longer in the downtown and to spill more money than they set out to do. Um, the Apple Store has sales of $5,000 a square foot per year. Apple Store sales are so high that if they're in your mall, Wall Street won't let you count them in the average because they double your average sales for the mall. Same with Tesla. We're working with a mall right now in California that has sales of 1,200 a square foot, but when you take out Tesla and Apple, the sales are 300 a square foot. Just those two retailers are high. The Apple store in New York City, that's pictured here, has sales of $66,000 a square foot per year, and that's in a 10,000 square foot basement with no windows. Go figure, but it's open 24 seven, and it's in front of the GM building. So when you think about it this way, 350 a square foot isn't that hard to imagine. Yeah. Seaside Florida, where we've had the privilege of consulting, uh, has average, this is a public number there I'm allowed to share, has an average sales of $1,100 a square foot per year, three times the national average, and a full, almost four times the national average, and they do those sales in three months. It, people always say, we're in Florida, we can't uh, have high sales because it's hot here in the summer. And I say, get over it. You know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You have three wonderful seasons. Everywhere in the country has a bad quarter. In Michigan, our bad quarter is the first quarter. Nobody goes outside. But uh, we do well. And so Seaside does the sales in three months. They have little uh, Airstream trailers. I don't know whether you've been there. Little Airstream trailers that do a million dollars a square foot. I mean, a million dollars a square foot, a million dollars a year in little Airstream trailers. They have a, a, a grilled cheese sandwich store that does over a million dollars a year in grilled cheese sandwiches. It's a fast grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> so why not apply those principles to your downtown? Don't be afraid of having high sales. There's a lot that good uh, comes from that. You know, they'll fight it. Uh, the Lifestyle Center was 